Thank you for tuning in to Ocean Rays Podcast. And now, your host, the godfather of sustainability, celebrity chef Rick Moonen. Everybody, uh, this is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. Um, here's where we get to dive into deep conversations with some of the original gangsters of cuisine. Um, the name of the podcast is Ocean Raised because we're all globally connected by the oceans and the food culture that it shares with us all. I get to speak with a man that personifies this notion of the ocean, Chef Emeril Lagasse, born October 15th, 1959 in Fall Rivers, Massachusetts. His dad was uh, French Canadian. His mother was Portuguese. So he worked uh, as a young kid uh, in a Portuguese bakery uh, where he saw the magic happening. You know, he fell in love with food, eventually graduated Johnson and Wales in 1978. And uh, his cooking style or his influences were always Cajun, Creole, French, and uh, Portuguese, of course. In 1982, he took over the position of executive chef from Paul Prudhomme at Commander's Palace, where he stayed there for seven and a half years. Um, and that was, uh, let's see, so in 1990, you opened Emeralds in NOLA, uh, critical acclaim, of course, uh, designated by Esquire Magazine as Restaurant of the Year, uh, first year open, and that's four years before Food Network. So this is, you know, this guy here is a, 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 a true cuisinier and lover of food and everything else. And today's executive, show, uh, executive chef and owner of over uh, 13 restaurants in New Orleans, Vegas, um, Orlando, Florida, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and now Coastal just opened up in Destin, Florida on the Gulf. And I hope we get to talk a lot about that because it's all seafood. Um, and also, he's obviously no stranger to the camera or live audiences. Uh, and will make cooking fun and exciting for everyone. He was taping seven shows a day at one point from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Where he, you know, got all of his monikers and everything that everybody knows and recognizes him for, like, bam, kick it up a notch. You know, oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> feel the love, pork fat rules, you know, but all in all, he was teaching and living his life and just, you know, and his message always was don't hold back. That's what he was telling you. Don't hold back. Don't be afraid, you know, and he's also an amazing um, philanthropic uh, and, and, and uh, charitable individual. You know, he's uh, gotten many awards, uh, culinary awards and philanthropic. Um, he's come out with many, a lot of merchandise and products, but, you know, in um, 2002, this was, this was what important is uh, he started the Emerald Agassi Foundation, creating opportunities for uh, dis disadvantaged children to help them reach their full potential. So, I mean, Deepwater Horizon, uh, Hurricane Katrina, the list of generosity and spirit, awesome cuisine, and this love of the ocean goes on and on. So, Emerald, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Well, my good friend, Chef, we have a, a lot of spirit together. Thanks for having me. And it's always a pleasure being with you, visiting with you, and talking seafood with you. Yeah. Because I know where your passion lies as well with the ocean. For me, it's real simple. You know, growing up in Fall River, um, I was influenced at a young age. My dad would, we would go out fishing in a small, my uncle's small boat, come home, bring the catch to mom, <clears throat> help her prepare what we caught. Mostly cod, tatog, um, haddock, blue bluefish, um, and I have a lot of great memories of of the ocean. I mean, um, I remember going with my parents to right outside of Newport, Rhode Island, periwinkle on the on the rocks. Uh, I remember being waist high uh, in the water with my feet. Uh, digging for clams. Mm -hmm. So those memories still exist, but what exists is my, my passion and my love for the ocean. Um, as you know, I have Emerald's Fish House in New Orleans at the MGM and a fish house in Bethlehem, but we just recently opened Coastal, Emerald's Coastal mm -hmm. in San Destin, which is all about seafood. Um, we have a fried chicken, mm -hmm. we have two steaks, we have a pork chop, and the rest is all seafood. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to thank the real deal. So putting this restaurant together was a lot of fun with my chef, uh, Chef Frank. Um, because of the situation that we're all in, I had very little people. So I had to also be the general contractor, 
um, sometimes the plumber, the electrician, whatever. But spearheading this, and it was, Rick, I have to tell you, it was um, an incredible experience to, to do that <laughs> beside having the time to really think. You know, when you, when you have the time as we've had yeah. to really think about life, to think about family, friends, um, but to conceptualize, to have the time to conceptualize uh, these, this seafood-centric restaurant was a lot of fun. So we have a message that's on the left-hand beginning flap of the menu that tells a little story about what I just told you about growing up in Fall River and my dad and et cetera. And then we talk about, um, I talk about, you know, when you, when you have the, the passion and when you have people that have the passion, like the fishermen that we're working with, and the farmers that we're working with, and you get these incredible ingredients, then it's really, it's, it's easy to cook when you have great ingredients, and then which creates great food. Yeah, but you're talking about relationships, you know, and yes. it's relationships with our ocean, relationships with our customers, relationships with the people that bring these products to us that, you know, we are privileged, privileged and honored to be able to get. I mean, without it, what are we, you know, <laughs> we have nothing. Exactly. So you're absolutely right. And, and that brings me to the coastal menu after that left hand flap in the story. When you flip the menu over, I acknowledge all of those fishermen mm -hmm. and farmers that are providing the products for us and really just paying tribute to them. And then when you flip the menu back over the blackboards that are in the restaurant sort of tell the story of what the seafood story of the day so we have a custom built seafood display, just like if you were going to a fish market, but very modernized for a restaurant that displays all the whole fish that comes in every morning from the fishermen. And then that fish is on display that night when service is over. And the next morning that fish gets all prepared and filleted for the stations and the next morning the new fish lobsters clams oysters etc come in from all of these different fishermen oystermen etc and i'll tell you what we've been open this is um, our second week yeah and we're having a blast <laughs> we're just absolutely having a blast i mean i made arrangements with another fisherman who i've known over the years in portland maine so three days a week we get lobsters from the boat to the front door three days a week fresh lobster meat and lobsters so there's really nobody doing that here especially in the panhandle mm -hmm. um you know we we're in miramar beach so we're right across the street from the ocean from the gulf mm -hmm. and as you know more than anyone um i happen to be a little passionate about fishing and <laughs> and fish <laughs> yes we are <laughs> and so um that's what we're doing that's that's what it's all about my friend that's amazing uh, we jumped right into seafood obviously because we can't help ourselves but i wanted to ask you some questions about growing up and how you you went from fall river mass which i remember going to with my kids and cub scouts and we slept on the the uss massachusetts overnight the destroyer that was right there you know and um and how you got from there to new orleans where you really became um, typecasted, so to speak, you know, and rightfully so, because you were broadcasting this amazing, you know, excitement of, of cuisine at the time, you know, and continue to, excuse me. Um, but did you, did you have any siblings, your brothers or sisters growing up? I have a, a I have a younger brother, uh, not, not much younger, who still work, we work together. Right. Um, he, he sort of takes care of sort of the real estate things and mm -hmm. maintenance things of it of the of the, of the business gotcha my dad who's 93 still works with us every day <laughs> still going strong so he's the first guy in the restaurant in new orleans um mm -hmm. pretty much every morning um and i had uh, uh a sister who passed um about a year and a half ago uh due to that crazy thing called cancer yeah. um and she was 
Right there, she was right very there. close. Yeah, she was very, very close. We were close. I'm, I'm very close to my brother, and I was very close to my, my sister. Her son, my nephew, is in the restaurant business. He worked for me uh, when we had our Miami restaurant. He worked for me when we had our Orlando restaurant. And um, now he he's opened a, a little small uh, bakery, uh, sort of quick serve, but high quality in New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is the next the next big town. Sure. Uh, from Fall River. <laughs> He's moving out. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that was a setup because I wanted to ask you the question, who, who was the best cook in the family growing up? Uh, my mom, for sure. And, and I have still, Rick, a lot of influences from her. Um, her style. I, I have a clam dish that's so simple right now. Is these beautiful, small, little neck clams. Mm -hmm. And I... We cook them in the, in the pizza oven with uh, just a little broth and olive oil, garlic, and chorizo. Yeah, of course. And Portuguese <laughs> chorizo. Yeah. And we do them in the oven until those clams just, you know, just open up just so delicately, <laughs> brothy, uh, served with some, some toasted Portuguese bread. Um, I have well, that dish on the menu right the now. Oils the oils come out of that chorizo, color the oh, broth a little bit pink, it, right? It, it, exactly. Oh, I could taste it right now, brother. Yep. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so um, who was your most influence on your professional career? Like, a men Did you have a mentor? Yeah, I had lots of them, actually. But I would say probably um, I read a lot about Paul Bocuse. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had the pleasure of not only meeting, but working with and becoming really good friends with Roger Verge. Mm -hmm. So Roger was, um, Mr. Verge was a big influence uh, on my classic side of cooking. Right. And professionally, as a gentleman, there was no better gentleman, especially coming from the kitchen. You know, I can see him right now as I'm speaking with you. Mm -hmm. you, always, you always had a white shirt with a tie and then his chef coat, and um, the, he was just unbelievable. And he classically taught me a lot. And then probably my American mentor uh, was a chef by the name of Larry Forgione, yeah. um, who was at the River Cafe when I met him. Uh, then he opened the American Place. We became really super good friends. Um, and... He was a big American chef influence. Uh, Larry, you know, was very focused on, uh, and still is, on, on American ingredients and the American farms and American fishermen. And I, I, I think my other mentor, of course, was Ella Brennan. Um, she, she really taught me what the restaurant business is really all about, what hospitality is all about with people are all about mm -hmm. and reading people and understanding people. And, and, and I'll, I'll never forget one of the moments at commander's palace. I was a young, young chef. And, you know, I, I guess when we're young, we, most of us have tempers and I, I certainly <laughs> had one. And um, I remember the Sunday brunch that we were doing and things were flaring up and uh, I, I was flaring up and she just, quietly was standing there and then she just came over and she had this little piece of paper folded up and she handed it to me and she said read that later when you when you cool down a little bit mm -hmm. and I was like oh no <laughs> and <laughs> so <laughs> service was service was winding down we were getting out of the weeds yeah. and um, mm -hmm. I opened up the paper and she said do me a favor Tomorrow, leave your ego at home. <laughs> <laughs> Always be humble, baby. You know, and that's funny because that kitchen uh, was kind of magical for so many people and so many things. You know, mm -hmm. um, I recall a story that I've been told from a, a mutual friend of ours is, you know, Jim Fifield and uh, I think it was Shep Gordon were dining at Commander's Palace when you were, I'm not sure what position you had in the kitchen at the time, but here's how the story that I heard. So um, just to give you a little background on these people, uh, uh, Jim Fifield was running EMI Records at the time, a very, very popular and, and, and great man. Mm -hmm. And Shep Gordon was uh, Alice Cooper's uh, manager, I believe, at the time, et cetera. And so these guys are deeply involved in the entertainment business. 
Now they're walking through the kitchen to go to their table through, uh, through Commander's Palace and Emeril somehow interacted with them and told them that he would like to cook for them that evening. And they, of course, said, sure. And they became great friends. And through that relationship, they um, started to give chefs a, a, a bigger and better voice and understanding of who they are. They're not just the guy in the back of the kitchen anymore. You're entertaining people. You're bringing something to them that matters to them. And that has a value. The same as Alice Cooper up on the stage, et cetera. And he had people recognize that along with you. Now, I've never asked you about that. Is that pretty much the story as it went? In yeah, I, I didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, there were four of them. It was Jim and his then wife, Betsy Shep, and uh, a George, an, an, another gentleman in the music business by the name of George Greif. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever met George. I had that really rusted voice. Oh, like uh, yes, that. I have. Yes. Right. <laughs> so it was the four of them. And we're packed. It's it's jazz fest, oh, and it of course yeah packed. that's why they'd go sure. Saturday night jazz fest packed. Mm -hmm. So there's maybe forty people at the bar, which then they have to like kind of find their way at the time. Still today, although today there's a kitchen table there, but there wasn't then. Mm -hmm. So they would sort of come out of the bar and spill into the kitchen, sure. the corner of the kitchen, and I I caught their eye and. Um, and and then, as you said, the story I asked it. First of all, they I called a maitre d, George Rico at the time. God bless him. I said, George, what's going on with this uh, this party? I believe it's on the Fife Field. And he said, Oh, he, George is really fast on his feet. I, don't know, I, I think it's going to be forty five minutes. Okay, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> I said, George, you got to do better than that. Okay. Why don't you give me the best table that you have up in the garden room that's open right now? Because I'm going to cook for these people. I don't know. Oh, God. Jeez, I'm going to make a lot of other people mad. Oh, my God. Okay. So I went to, to Jim and Shep, and I said, um, right this way, your table's ready. And, of course, they were, like, shocked. Took them upstairs, best table in the garden room, table 50. Sat them down. Had drinks. Wine list. They're all into wine. And I said, you know, if you like, I'll, I'll cook for you and, uh, you know, order you wine and I'll cook for you. And um, the end of that meal, um, still didn't know who they really were. Now, his Jim, as you know, uh, being as great of friends as I am with him, he's the, he's the president and CEO of EMI Records worldwide. Okay. And Shep Gordon, who, you know, he's repping Alice. Luther Vandross, Michael Douglas. I mean, I could go on and on. Sharon Stone. I could go on and on and on. Don't know who they are. And they're like scratching their heads because they're wondering, who, do, who does this guy think we are? So at the end of the meal, we go downstairs to have a nightcap in the bar. Want to give them a nightcap. And they wanted to see um, a band that was playing at Tipitina's. Yeah, the music club, and they couldn't get in. So I got them each a cognac in a to-go cup. And on a paper napkin, I wrote, and I said, hey, Roland, it's Emerald. Will you please let my friends in? And I folded up the paper, and I said, here, when you get to the front door, just give this, give this to the guy. And they immediately got in. Oh, man. Um, and, and so I never heard from them anymore because, again, I, I didn't really know who who they were. Yeah, but you got Fifield coupons now, brother. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then finally, and then finally I get, finally, like, I left that year to open Emeralds, mm -hmm. and I get a call. And he says, do you remember me? At, uh, last year at Jazz Fest, we came, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, well, my name's Jim Fifield, and... I was with a guy by the name of Shep Gordon and we want to come jazz fest. We want to come to your restaurant. We want to come to Emeralds. Yep. And then the relationship just For the rest started of happening. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing, Rick, is that, um, life's funny like that, right? I mean, you just, you never know. Something told you to take care of these people. 
and you you had no idea, and it turns around that they, uh, you know, sim- sim- well, it's what El- it's what Ella taught me about you know being hospitable and what hospitality truly means. Yeah, I, pff, my gosh. Now you, Emily, we've known each other a long time, and uh, you know, back in the before nineteen ninety four, you know, we were just cooks, squeezing years. We all knew each other, or we heard of each other, you know, et cetera. We've worked together, we did charities together, whatever. But once the Food Network started, then all of a sudden the celebrity status started to be slapped on, and and it's. Uh, an interesting transition for all of us, because for me, you know, I was asked to do an, uh, you know, uh, when Food Net- TVFN was, to Television Food Network came on, I was asked to do a cooking demonstration, you know, because someone didn't show up because of the plane delay or flight cancellation. So I go, yeah, I'll do it. I did it that night. I had my son with me and I'm on, on TV. But, you know, way before all that, I'm like, what? you want me to do what? Get in front of people and do what? So. I just wanted to ask you of, uh, you know, uh, did, did, what was the influence of Lou Eckes, you know, Lou and Lisa, I think they were the, the, together at the time. Were they a good influence on you as far as creating a, an Emeril Lagasse style? No, I, I, I wouldn't say they developed the style. I, I, I will say that um, they worked out of their home mm-hmm. uh, in upstate Massachusetts at the time. And they had a media training company. So I had my first book coming out, New New Orleans Cooking. Mm-hmm. And like you and I, I I was, you know, and still am, but I was a cook. I, I didn't really know how to handle, a, you know, a serious interview or how to handle a television interview or a radio interview. Right. So my publisher sent me to a three-day class that they had for media training. Mm-hmm. And... Um, we became friends, um, and besides becoming friends, uh, they just taught me the basics about, you know, facing and being with the media, sort of what to do and not to do, because there's a lot of things that you shouldn't do, you know, like scratching your face or picking your nose or whatever. I mean, there's just things that are basic common sense, but... So we had this relationship, and I think that they did a great job, not only with me, but there were a lot of other people who you know that were in that class and in past and future classes that they had. So they were a good basis, and then we became friends and, you know, stayed, stayed in touch. Um, haven't heard from them in quite a while, no. but it, it, was the, it, was, right, it was the basics that I learned that then I could apply my – my personal experience mm-hmm. or my personal personality into what I, what I was doing. Right. Now, did that influence how I did television? No. Um, it, it sort of gave me the guidelines, but you know, it's, it's pretty hard to be someone else <laughs> when you're, when you're shooting as much television. I, you know, I shot over 2000 shows. Yes. So, you know, what I did learn is just to be yourself and, and why not? Why, why do you have to pretend to be something else? So just be yourself. Just have fun, I guess, is, you know, cause you're, yeah. besides that genuine, um, that came across perfectly, you know, and I knew your mom had a big influence on you. I used to watch her, you know, I know the Portuguese and you know, the chorice and the, the linguiça and the, you know, all of the what's, sweet bread, right? Were you, were you cooking sweet yeah. bread back then? Yeah. Boot that's, masa. Yeah. That's unbelievable. All right. You know what? Let's, let's uh, swim back to the ocean and get back to Destin and talk a little bit about seafood. I want, I want you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, fresh and frozen. How do you feel about that? Fresh or frozen? Well, I, I'm 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 not a big frozen guy myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with frozen, if it's handled and done properly. Uh, there are some good frozen products out there. There are some some day boats and trip boats out there that you know, like in Alaska as an example, that are you know doing cod or uh, whatever. Th- th- there's some there's some good product out there as well. Right. Um, you know. I go to a local restaurant and I'm without putting anybody under the bus, you know, <laughs> and I, and I just can't believe like I'm, I'm speaking with you right now, but I'm like maybe 75 feet from the water on the Bay side. Right. Uh, 
where I live. And then directly across, maybe a mile, is the ocean. Right. And it blows my mind to go to local restaurants and, and you know, it's like, what's your fish today? Uh, it's Barramonde. What? Yeah, it's Barramonde from Australia. You live across the street from the ocean. <laughs> what are you serving Barramonde for? How, how long do you think it takes to get from Australia here? And, and, and a lot of, uh, I'll tell you what makes Coastal already insane is because of the attention to detail and the attention to quality of product because the fish is so fresh, the seafood is so fresh that people are like gasping saying, you know, I've lived here all my life on the ocean and I've never had fish fresher than this. No, no. And, and it's not. like, you know, like last night we had uh, the three fish on the, on the chalkboard was red snapper, cobia, mm. uh, and grouper. Uh, grouper is extremely popular in Florida. Yeah. Uh, we had vermilion snapper that we did as the whole fish last night that we roasted in the pizza oven with, uh, and then served it with fried rice and then a lobster ginger sauce. That was the whole fish. We had Murder Point oysters from um, Alabama, Beausoleil oysters last night. Can't, I can't keep enough oysters. Yep. And Louisiana oysters, not only you can have them raw, but the Louisiana oysters are the char-grilled oyster that we're doing, which is fat. You have to. They have the right fat content. They're perfect. 100%. 100%. Okay, so I agree. And, and, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What were you go, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I agree with you 100% about fresh is the best and living on the ocean and living on the coast and being there. And what you, what you offer to people is worth flying in from everywhere across the United States to try it. I mean it because I'm excited. Yeah. I can't wait to come and check it out. No, myself. and that's the, that's the thing. Like your restaurant, my restaurant in, in Las Vegas, mm. when, when I went 22 years ago, almost 23 years ago in Las Vegas at the MGM, and they said, what are you, what are you, what are you going to do? And this is like when no one was there. Right. Yeah, you were you had, you had Mark Miller had Coyote Cafe. Yeah. Wolfgang had his cafe and he had Spago. Right. And then um, Charlie had a short, Charlie Trotter had a short stunt there. Yeah, it was done in And they said to me, yeah. And then they said to me, well, what do you want to do? I said, I'm going to do a fish restaurant. And they were like, you're in the middle of the desert. What are you, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? But tributed to you, tributed to a little bit myself. No, you, you paved the way for that. You did. They, we have as fresh a fish in Las Vegas as, as anywhere else, and we're in the middle of the desert. And that's because it's A, Las Vegas, B, mm -hmm. uh, the corral of chefs together, working together, that have put the best purveyors together, fishermen together, to get, get the best. Yeah. Well, I had a lot of connections when I came to Vegas from New York. I'd already established an amazing network of connections with, uh, you know, with resources, you know, be it from Louisiana or if I needed crawfish, I knew people I could call like yourself. Say, hey, who's the guy? And you say right away, no problem. You know, John Falls is a friend of mine as well. He, he's hooked me up on stuff like that. So you have your network is what it boils down exactly. to. Exactly. Now you have a network of restaurants that go beyond coastal. So now you've got a, you have seafood on those menus as well. I mean, so when we talk about frozen and fresh, you know, we're going to take in different considerations to have some consistency on certain menus as well. You know, I'm just talking is, is, is a broader mentality. Trust me, I'm always about wild and fresh. <laughs> if you can get it right out of the boat and eat it, that's the best thing in the world. Right. So what about um, uh, aquaculture? Do you, do you, what, what are your feelings on I I, well I, done? I, su I support it, uh, but I support it done the right way. Right on. Um, I, I'm not, I don't believe in a bunch of chemicals. Nope. Uh, I don't believe in a bunch of fortification in the water to fortify fish to either give them color or to give them fat content. I don't believe in that. I believe in natural. Now, I've had some darn good farm-raised catfish from Mississippi. Sure. You know, <laughs> and I've had some damn good uh, redfish. And, and that, that, that's a problem because, you see, in Louisiana, redfish is probably the most popular fish, redfish and speckled trout, right. which I fish for right here in my backyard. <laughs> Love to take your speckled trout fishing in the fall. Oh, I'm in. Um, and, but you can't buy it unless you're a commercial fisherman. Right. 
um, because there's a ban. Excuse me, let me take that back. Even commercial fishermen can't sell redfish and speckled trout. Unless you're uh, an individual fisherman with a fishing license, you can fish for that, but you can't commercially buy it. And the reason for that is, is our friend Paul Prudhomme, I know. back when, Pan black and popularized so much black and redfish that they, they had to put a ban on it. And, 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 and I, don't ask me, I don't want to get political, okay, but why all of this time, what's it been, 30 years, 25 years, all this time you haven't lifted the ban? There's yeah. so much redfish and trout out there. So mm -hmm. I, to answer your question, so I had to rely on a farm aquaculture from Texas to yeah. get my redfish. Well, I have a little bit of history in following aquaculture. And I, I, in the beginning, I hated the idea of it. You know, when I was graduating out of, uh, you know, from, I was going from the water club to Oceana. I made a promise to people that I knew really close. I said, I'm not going to use any of that farm stuff. You know, I'm mean, all fresh. Here we are. We're on Long Island. We, we have all these resources, the Fulton fish market. Unbelievable. So, you know, as, as things changed and as I became a lot more aware, aquaculture became more and more of a, an important thing to consider, except that they were doing things poorly. It was early on. They had a lot of things to learn about, things that you brought up, chemicals. And the thing that became most publicly alarming was the idea that color additives were being put into their feed to keep, even though they were made out of carotenoid sources, et cetera, no one wanted to hear about it. So the aquaculture industry take, starts hitting big black eyes because of, of, of all of this. And I was part of the voice that was saying, yeah, give them a good one. Poof. They're screwing things up. You know, they're using chemicals to take lice off the of salmon. And of course, it start, because the lice are, you know, a crustacean, then the lobsters started getting affected by it. Oh, my God. They made a mistake. They got fined big bucks. They learned. They evolved. And so now here we are. It's 2020, which is like a curse word now. You're going to go back to, don't make me go back to 2020. The... Um, technology and ingenuity that's been happening. And this is from my perspective, and it's kind of like been a long-term you know, project of mine to following along with aquaculture. And um, they've, there's a, the Forever Oceans who sponsors this is where this is going, obviously. But the, the reason I'm, I'm bringing it up in conversation is because, you know, I don't feel that the seafood industry celebrates enough ahead of time. They wait till they get punched and then they have to react to it. That's been right. the history of it, you know, because people don't love fish. They don't, no one's hugging a fish. It's not a sweet, loving, cute animal. There's, it's just a thing. People, sometimes it's a medicine to some people, but to you and I in a large part of the world, it's a passion. So back to, um, you know, forever oceans, they're, they have these, uh, they're taking um, different species that, you know, we haven't had in the past that are, have been available to us as chefs, you know, like red snapper, actually, no offense, I'm, but red snapper is one of the fish that they're looking to farm as well as, yeah. as grouper. So those are two gulf species, but amberjack is, would be the first. And they have these hatcheries, you know, uh, on land, you know, land-based hatcheries that are recirculating water. So it's all sustainable. I mean, it's shing, green light from the sustainability world. And then they take them out at a certain maturity and they put them in these pods of deep sea that are robotically controlled. And the, and the feed is very, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, uh, calculated and everything's perfect and that's and that, that's a pro and these products haven't even started to come out yet so i'm anxious to see this because i can't think of a um a box that i haven't checked off of concern of sustainability now it's going to be nutritious because of other heavy heavy uh research done into their uh, to their feed to make sure that they're nutritious which makes them delicious as well so if we yeah. can get all those things we get texture and all that i'm i don't know I'm, I'm just very interested to see because now i work for a company that has um you know, 18 different restaurants across the United States right now. I'm a master development right. chef and I need to consider things like that. I'm just wonder how, what, what's your gut feeling on all that? Well, I, you know, I, I, I saw an experimental project at the time. It's no longer experimental. It's, it's happening, but you know, I, there was a point in my life where I was spending a lot of time in Hawaii mm -hmm. and just maybe three, four times a year, you know, just, you know, for events or, friends or you know just chilling out and i remember 20 some years ago that there was a uh, an aquaculture project going on on the big island where they were doing lobsters okay and they were actually uh raising them in a hatchery and then potting them into the ocean and maintaining them and and then selling them mm -hmm. and i'm like 
there's no way lobster in Hawaii. Come on, give me a break here. Yeah. I grew up in the Northeast. I mean, I went to school in the Northeast. I mean, I have connections in Maine. I lived yeah. in Maine. It's like, yeah. come on. I think it's fair to say, you know, lobster. But, but, <laughs> but you know what? Yeah. But, you, but, but the thing is, is that it, 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 it was working. And I, I think a lot of people looked at that, that project as experimental, but looked at that project as a way of learning. And I think now, some of their techniques are, are, are filtering into other people that are raising fish. I think it's fascinating when, when I hear you talk about amberjack, snapper, grouper, if that can be done yeah, uh, and done the right way, yep. hey, I'd, I'd give it a shot. I mean, I'd, 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 I would love to try it. I'm spoiled because you, you know will. what was caught – yeah, what was caught yesterday, I'm getting today. Of course. Um, you know, and I, I think I think my fish is probably fresher than most seafood markets. Oh, absolutely. Um, I agree 100%. Yeah, but I'd give it a shot. I mean, I, I think it's, first of all, I think it's something that we need on this planet done the right way because, let's face it, there is some overfishing going on. Uh, Florida is very, very controversial uh, strict about season uh snapper you know red snapper season opens to the public june 15th mm. it closes you know august 8th that's it and and the coast guard's out there watching you yeah. and you know the same thing with you know tile fish and in, interesting enough tile fish is opened up a little bit because first of all who's going to go out and fish 1,400 feet of water mm -hmm. to catch a tile fish. How big Other than, You know, I, we caught one last week that was a monster. Probably yeah. probably 22 pounds. Nice. I haven't seen that and, in decades. And beautiful. And it's, the meat is so clean, as you know, because, you know, they're 1,400 feet down. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't have an electric reel, I don't know. Is that cheating? I, I, don't, I don't think it's cheating. I think it's smart smart <laughs> but you know i mean if you're going to try to reel that anyhow um there there's the like i said in florida they have they're very strict about the seasons and 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 really protecting the species that we that we do have yeah, i wish there was, was a little bit i wish there was a little bit more protection from the commercial side right right understood I agree. You know, because it's like those guys have like a license to what? To do whatever they want? Well, Noah's supposed to be giving them limits, you know, and uh, yeah. they're supposed to adhere to such, but now it becomes a derby, you know, because if they open up right. a short period of time, you know, there's these uh, catch shares. It's a, you know, there's an idea called catch shares, you know, and it's, being impl it's implemented in other areas of uh, other, you know, fishing sectors of our country. And uh, it's where the fishermen own certain portions of the catch you know and this is on the commercial side so this is probably you know not a love uh, so that's where mind. they're going here and that, that's where a lot of it's going here in florida well what that does catch, catch Ho shares. hopefully what that does it doesn't become a derby between this date and this date because those guys a it's not good for anyone because it gluts the martin with snapper during that period of time because everybody's going after them so now all the snappers are being taken out they're right. stressing that they're stressing everything out they're not taking care of the fish properly they're not doing it because they got to get more 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 we only have so many days you know and then, then they have to go out on days that may not be safe for them to go out on you know there's, a, there's something cold weather around there you know and then they exactly. can be really taking matters into but they only have this period of time that's but when you have a catch share you go is it's it's more supply and demand and it's more it's, it's it takes an ease on the ecosystem a little bit so i i personally think you know it might not be a bad idea but i don't know how that fares out and i know it's a huge humongous business is uh is, you, know, agri, you know it's a uh, recreation let me ask you a I recreation yeah, let me yeah. ask you a recreational question good <laughs> since we fish together and you and, and you know i'm a, a little crazy about fishing yes sir <laughs> the the trend right now in tournament fishing mm -hmm. at least on the gulf coast right is Quite a few boats now have these radars to detect fish mm -hmm. and where they are mm -hmm. and almost how big they are, i.e., especially if you're in a Blue Marlin Championship. 
Right, I understand. <laughs> so some of these boats now are catching seven, eight blue marlin for a weekend tournament because yes. they have this technology. Mm -hmm. And it's not cheap technology. So how do you feel about that? I, don't, I think that's cheating. I think yeah, that's cheating. Me too. You got you to gotta read the environment. You got to have something, you know? Exactly. You're flying kites or whatever you're doing with the bait, that's fine. You know, right. it, it doesn't matter. You can paint it a color that it's no one else fishing. is painting. It's still fishing. You're looking right. up at birds. You're looking down at seaweed, lines, waves, all of that. That's fishing. But exactly. when it comes to radar, just go straight there, throw in a line, pull it out, smile, take a picture. Who cares? What, exactly. what, do you, what, what do you get out of that? That's the number one problem with sustainability is overfishing. Technology's you know, uh, ability to uh, outpace the, 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 the catch. You, know, you can't yes. do that. I mean, what are you going to do? Right. Automatic weapons? <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. No, so, Anyhow, uh, we're, on the, we're on the same page. A hundred percent, man. I, 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 I'm, I'm involved uh, with some folks putting together in, in Alabama a, a tournament for next year. And basically the noise that I've made was like, none of those weapons should be allowed. We have to go back to old time fishing, you know? And I, and I, and I, I and I also express like, look, I, you know, I'm all about live baiting, but I don't know if that should be allowed in this tournament either. We should just go back to the old school of Junks. trolling <laughs> and trolling. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Wow. I love it. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, just recently, we, my wife and I went out, we were, we went, we, we slaughtered trout, you know, we have like a little place that we have to go I, I'm in up Idaho and, and you just take the dogs up there because the weather's been insane here in Vegas. We're going over 60 days now, over triple digits Three. figures. It's crazy. So anyway, just to troll in the morning, throwing your, throwing your lure and just, you know, have the boat just putting along and the sun's it's just great. coming up and the fish are killing it. There's, Connectiveness with our world, our ocean, our products, knowledge and understanding and openness to better ways, you know, when it comes to things such as aquaculture, you know, over 50% of what's consumed globally is now coming from farms or some sort of aquaculture, the largest sector being crustacean or, you know, you know clams and mussels and oysters, etc. But, you know, it's uh, the fin fish. Um, future in my career, you know, I've been in this, in this crazy industry 45 years now, I think something like that. I don't do the math anymore. I just say 45. I'm stuck on that. And yeah. um, this is, this is uh, kind of an interesting, you know, turn for me. You know, I've, I've, I've taken this time off and I've tried to educate myself on a lot of different things. And that's one of the, the uh, discoveries that I've, that I've connected myself with. And I'm just really excited about to see what about forever That's oceans awesome. can come out, you know, sometime next year. Well, I'm going to make sure you get samples sent to you. Don't worry. That's about. awesome. Yeah, that's that's want, that's and, awesome. And hopefully, I can hand deliver it to you, or we, we can go to a farm somewhere in Hawaii together and, uh, and check uh, out uh, what that would be great. What, what they're doing, you know. Yeah. So, you know, Emerald, I know that you mentioned to me that you had to, you know, get back to coastal today, and you know, the time was a, a little bit of a. Uh, a concern for you. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, go, go deep into anything else with you right now. I just want to tell you that I, I love you, brother. I look forward to fishing with you again. I love you too, man. Talking seafood. I love you and too. I hope coastal is uh, a constant, uh, you know, joy for you as it is. Right All now. right. So as a seafood, ma I consider you a seafood master chef. Okay. Give me your th three favorite fish. Oh boy. Three favorite fish. That's tough. I know. It it's is tough. tough. Well, one of them absolutely is cobia, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, um, and I, I, I you, served a lot you know of they migrate. You know they migrate here mm -hmm. in April and May. And now you can only, you can, you can still catch them, but they're on structure. So interesting enough, the state of Florida has, has started with three projects, mostly for Senate Council boats. Right. Where they built, um, they built devices, three of them that they've put out in the ocean, mm -hmm. that are easier for Santa Council boats to get to, so that they can at least catch bait, if not fish. Right. And it's being monitored by the Coast Guard. Right. And I think they're scheduled to do three more soon. But that. That didn't answer the question. You only gave me one, cobia. <laughs> cobia, okay. Now, I'm trying to think of, like... Uh, speckled trout? I love speckled trout. 
I love it. I, you know, I, haven't, I, I mean, we get brown trout, rainbow trout, but I haven't had speckled yeah. trout in forever. Wahoo? So, Wow, it's a great fish, man. Going down, <laughs> pulling that thing up, that big old thing. You go by Rex, right? Usually for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, I thought you, of you, I, I thought of you last night at Coastal because we got a we got a chunk about seventy pounds, which was a quarter of maybe a more than a quarter of of a fish. There was a bluefin that was caught. Oh boy, bluefin tuna that mm -hmm. was caught in the Gulf. I was thinking about you last night as I did two preparations on Coastal last night. Mm -hmm. I did a sashimi yeah. and I did a poke with bluefin yeah. tuna. Oh. And I said, if if Rick had this right now, he would <laughs> absolutely flip out. Man, I miss you so much. Uh, all right, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Let's you Let's do run. it again. All right, Let's I'd love to, again. man. You're, you're, yeah. fasc you're a fascinating interview, man. I just want to thank everyone for listening and you for your generous time and my parting thought is always just thanks uh, from Tim thank McGraw you very much song. friend always thank you very much enjoy yeah. camping god bless you i hope you catch some fish bring your cast iron pan <laughs> how do you know <laughs> I, I just heated it up before i interviewed you buddy <laughs> love take you. care bud all, all right, right you love too. you too all take right care. bud Bye. Take. foreveroceans.com